We, we, uh, we want to pick up where we left off. And uh, we, we had some very interesting questions presented to us and, uh, um, about, about clarification on uh, some of our tools. And so we're going to introduce a new tool tomorrow that will clarify it. But let me, let me just explain it. The question was, when you know yourself to lead yourself, if you know you need to change something, that's one thing. What makes you do it? And so tomorrow we're going to... Your wife. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if she's part of the equation. And it's true, isn't it? Sometimes you know you need to change something, but you need to be motivated to do it. So we're going to introduce a tool called CORE. And, and the, the object of CORE is that to take a learning objective. So, for example, I'll use myself with the self-autobiographical listening. It's one thing for me to say, hey, I tend to talk about myself a lot. It's another thing for me to say, that's a problem, right? So calling it out is saying, I've, I've called this out. I, I realize I, I have autobiographical listening, but I need to own it. They said, this is something that I need to work on. But then I need to go to a step further and say, what am I going to do? So for me, it was to say, okay, I, I recognize this tendency in me. I'm going to own it. And the reason I'm going to own it is because it leads to bad consequences. And so what I want to do is I want to respond to it. For me, it's simply saying, when, somebody's talk, when I'm talking to somebody, don't talk about yourself. That's my response. So I come, I come to that in my head. That's my response. I still have to execute that, don't I? And so the more I execute that, in other words, the more I don't talk about myself, the better I become as a leader because then it becomes a new pattern and a new tendency. So we'll show you that tool tomorrow. That's kind of a synopsis, and, uh, and if we'll work it out so uh, uh, somebody can get you a copy of it. You want to address this? I think we wanna, do we want to do that last point? Yes. It's not that one? We no, did no, that no, one. creating spaces, yes. Creating spaces. Oh, you want me to do that? Yeah, well. OK, well, I can do that. Should, well, I can't really help you on that core thing because I don't have anything I need, any tendencies I need to change. So I can't use an example. Ex except paying attention to where we are in the program. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't actually listening. <laughs> I was just trying to be interesting over here. Oh. The idea of creating spaces and environments for missionally living as a body. OK, who is the body? Y'all. You have, you have slang like that, and I'm sure you do in the Philippines. I, you know, where I come from back east, you know, we had, you know, you could say you, but it, and there were parts of the country where it's y'all. Yeah, y'all, that's, that's, or you -ins or, you know, and if it's, if I'm over here, it's us -ins. But, uh, yeah, y'all, we're us, we're the body, okay? And, and we're the body of who? Christ, Okay. So if we are going to create spaces and environments for missionally living as a body, we're living as the body of Christ, but we're being intentional about it. And I'm going to use that word a lot, intentionality, because it's really easy for us to do what we've always done. Um, in fact, those are, the, those are the seven deadly words of a dying church. Well, we've never done it that way before. Um, we, we get into the mindset that, well, you know, we're going to show up, we're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're going to do so many songs and there's going to be announcements and, and we're going to play Speaking of Life and we're going to then have a sermon and, and then we're, you know, we're going to sing a song and do a benediction and, and, and we're going to do it that way because that's pretty much how the Apostle Paul led evangelistic campaigns in Corinth. And so we, we get into this mindset that we just keep doing, well, this is saying, no, no, we need to create spaces. We need to create events. We need to create an environment where we function together. I've got a small little group, a little fellowship group in, in Oak Ridge, Oregon. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere up in the mountains. It was a mill town. They, they made lumber for years, and then the mills all closed down. So it's, it's a town of... 3,500 people, there's no major employment of any kind. It's, it's a fairly impoverished little community, and it's about an hour away from any, any town of any size. We started a small fellowship group up there a lot of years ago, and, and it's still a small fellowship group. It, we've had a lot of people come through it. But there's an element of it that, that every time I get the opportunity to go up and hang out with them, um, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this principle in action. 
Because this little group in, engages so many other people, so many things that they do. They are so intentional about living out like, like a, you know, the early Acts church. They are doing um, meals together. They are doing functions together. They're doing outreach together. But they're doing it together. They're doing it as a body, but they are living in the community. It's real easy for us to do the, the ghetto events. I'll use that term again. To do the thing that we do that's an inward event. And, we, and those are great. We like potlucks. I love potlucks, if, if you can tell. I like potlucks. Um, you know, and, and I like when we come together and we do movie night and we do, but, but the idea of, okay, what are we doing where we're living missionally? Well, missionally, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but missionally is not where, you know, if, if I were to ask the question, in this room or outside that door, where is your mission field? We have, a, we have a sign in my church parking lot. You are now entering your mission field when they drive out of church each week. Church is not the playing field. Church is the locker room for the game when we come together as a group. And so if we live missionally, we're probably going to be living together as a body missionally out there. Yeah, one of the questions that was brought up to me was uh, uh, the con concept of the term of unchristian, calling people unchristian. Uh, that goes over really well with people, doesn't it? Hi, you, my name's Rick. I'm a Christian, and uh, I assume you're an unchristian yeah. or, or non-Christian or just pagan. Yeah. I'm I mean, the, the whole concept is, is if we look at people as, as, as children that God created that he wants to have an intimate relationship with, we know that we have to take, make sure that our churches are welcoming that environment, Right. We want to make sure that there's space for them. And here's a tendency, a tendency that we have is know yourself to lead yourself can also be know your team to lead your team, know your church to lead your church. So as you go through the process, you'll get it, you'll get it bigger and bigger. But a tendency in our churches is to, be, is to really love each other really, really well, so well that other people come in and don't have a place to belong. Have you ever experienced that? Mm -hmm. They come in and they just see this group that gets along so well and they can't fit into it. And it's because we've not intentionally, like Tim says, created that space, created that environment that we want them to become a part of us. And so, but part of that is to realize the way I phrase it is they just don't know their papa yet. Yeah. They're like orphan children who you get to introduce to their daddy and when they find out their daddy is a daddy who absolutely adores them. In fact, he created them to adore them. That changes. And so we start thinking in terms of creating space for them. But we're going to go into a little more detail now as we go through the difference between missional and missionality. As we move into that, let me just remind you of, of a three-letter English word that you'll see in, in an English translation Bible that Paul uses a lot, and it, and it really speaks to this, and it's that word, all. All have died in Christ and, and have, have risen. All have been reconciled to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. All are. And, and you really begin to understand, and it's one of the, you know, and we're not here to do theology per se, but it is one of the fundamental elements of recognizing that all does not mean just y'all. It, it means them too. It means all. And yeah, I do that with my congregations. And if I say all means, they're all going to shout the word all. That's significant when we come to understand that. Let's try that. All means? See, when we understand that all means all, there is no longer a case of us and them. There's only us and those that don't know they're us yet. And so when we use terms like unbeliever or, or lost, that's a fun one. Try explaining that one to somebody who's like, you know, postmodern, you know, millennial, and you'll have lots of fun with that. So, Are you lost? No. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly where I am. <laughs> What's your problem? Okay. Missional. What do we mean when we say missional? It's understanding the church as a sent organism. Sent. Obviously, what does that mean? That we're, we're not happy with, we're not content with being inside. As like Tim just said, the missional field is outside. And I, I keep going to churches and saying, you are doing so good work inside these doors, but your mission field is outside those walls. And, and discipleship is good and it's, it's wonderful, but the purpose of discipleship is to send you outside those walls <laughs> and to build relationships with people. So the church is, is, 
is understand the church is a sent organism to participate, like I said earlier in the, in the Great Commission, or what I call the Great Invitation, to participate in Jesus' mission. What is his mission? I think the scripture says that he's not willing that any should perish, he, that his goal is to bring all sons to glory. That's a, that's a, I'd like to be a part of that mission. I'd like, to, I'd like to, Jesus to say, well done, you helped bring sons, sons and daughters to glory. Well done, you, you participated with me. Not well done, you stayed inside your church where you're safe. But you understood what it meant to be sent. So our first one is it is activating, and that's a key word, activating the missional mind, heart, and hands for gospel proclamation and demonstration in everyday life. When I say activate, what does that mean to anybody? You're not being very active. <laughs> <laughs> to be alive, okay, that's good. To be alive, what else? Over there, Tim. Functional. Okay. Yeah, it's you know when you when you talk about mind, heart, and hands, um, what else is there? Is, isn't it kind of I mean we could say you know spleen, liver, toes toenails, elbows, but what are we saying? It's activating your whole body and realizing that you as an individual, spiritually, physically, and psychologically, you are sent out to participate with Jesus in missional work. Mm -hmm. The idea of discerning Jesus' movement in our everyday spaces and engaging um, missionally, discerning. We talked about activating. What does discerning mean? What's that? Understanding? Yeah. To come to understand, to come to see, discern, to, to, to see into. Um, and so to discern Jesus' movements. Um, there's, there's an interesting, um, interesting uh, Abraham Lincoln quote, one of an American president, that um, he, we, we too often will... will, will come up with an idea, we're going to do a whatever it is in your church. You're going to do an outreach activity. You're going to open a food bank. You're going to whatever. And we pretty much put it all together, and then we, what do we do? We ask God to bless it, right? Well, Abraham Lincoln made an interesting comment in one of his inaugural addresses. He said, let us, let us pray that we are on God's side rather than God being on our side. And, and discernment is really that action of seeing what is Jesus doing already. What is Jesus doing in your community? Where are the opportunities? Where has he gifted you and called you to step into that? So that we can begin to, you know, and it's not just creating. It, is, it, it says that, Jesus movements in our everyday spaces. That's where you work. That's where you live. That's, that's where you go to school. That's where you hang out. What's Jesus up to in your community? And then how, instead of creating something artificial and then asking Jesus to stop what he's doing over there and come and bless this, it's stepping back and saying, what is Jesus already doing? We can clearly see that we are gifted to step into and begin to engage. It's amazing how many times you talk to somebody and they share an example of how they we're sharing Christ with somebody and discipling somebody, and they'll say, and I didn't even think about it. I wasn't doing it intentionally. I was simply being. I was, a, I was at work, and it's a coworker who said, I need you to pray for me, or I need to talk to you about some, something. Or I'm walking down the street, and a neighbor, I see a neighbor's upset, and I start talking, and it becomes natural. And it's because you are listening to what Jesus is doing. We can go out and we can seek people, or we can look at the people that Jesus has already put around us and put in our lives and say, perhaps that's what he's doing. And it's discerning that. And then we go right from that to the next step, which Tim is gonna show you. And that is when, those, when those people enter our lives or when Christ has put those people in our lives, we create space for them. One of the biggest problems in Christianity is what is called bait and switch. Does anybody know what that means? It means you go out and you, you build a relationship with somebody and you bring them to church and you say, there, and then you leave them, and you go out and build a relationship with somebody else. 
That is not a relationship. That's a bait and switch. I brought you here so you can be saved or whatever phrase you, you use, and now I'm not interested. That's not relationship. That's not, that's not what God has called us to do. So if we are discerning, and that happens when we try to do the work outside of <laughs> discerning the Lord's will, but when we find somebody that some, God has placed in our life, whether it's a work environment, school environment, church environment, neighborhood environment, that's when we share their life. We share life with them. We create space for them. We start listening to them. We get ourselves out of the picture. Now, when you have a relationship, think about the people you have the closest relationship with. That could be a spouse. Uh, it could be a really good friend. It could be a brother. What is the one thing that you and that person do together? Do you communicate well? Do you spend time together? Do you trust each other? Do you listen to each other? All these things that require time, that require creating space. And pardon? Bonding. Absolutely. These are the things that we're talking about. Discerning who Jesus is bringing into your life and then creating spaces with them so discipleship making can take place. Now, if I come up to Reuben here and I say, Reuben, my name is Rick and I want to make you a disciple. Reuben's like, great. How do I get out of this conversation? <laughs> But if I come up and say, hey, my name's Rick, you know, um, I've been watching you, you're kind of a co-worker, I've seen your time, how about we just go get some tea together during break, then we just start talking. I'm not even going to mention Jesus to him. I'm going to mention him to him. Tell me about yourself. And then I'm not going to do that autobiographical listening until he says, tell me about yourself. But we're going to build a relationship. Through that relationship, one day Reuben's going to say, man, you are just a positive person. What is it about you? Well, it's, it's Jesus in me. I don't, I don't care about that Jesus stuff. Well, then forget you. Is that what we do? No, we just say, that's all right. You know, that's okay. Let's just talk. Let's be friends. That's creating space. That's putting my life into his life, sharing his life, and, be, and becoming a friend with him first. And you know what? That relationship may never end, may never end with him coming to church, but it doesn't matter because God has called me to build a relationship and share his love and his life with someone. And you know, they talk about the, I don't remember what the phrase is of seven touches before you come to church or something like that. You don't know where you are in that process, but you are joining Jesus and what Jesus is doing. Before we jump to um, a, a slightly different variation of the word missional and we begin to look at the, con the difference between missional and missionary, let me give you a, um, a flip um, version of, of what Rick just, just said. We, um, when we enter into these relationships, again, it's a question of being aware. It's a question of being intentional. We, um, I, we, I, we were chatting um, before, and, and uh, uh, there was a day when our, our, our church talked about that we were ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But we were so afraid to share our faith or even talk about our faith that in all honesty, we weren't ambassadors for Jesus. We were secret agents for Jesus. You know, it's just, well, don't, don't figure out that I go to church, whatever you do. Um, and, and so an example that, that really has stuck in my mind, and it was a good friend and, a, um, and a, um, one of my bosses who lived in the same neighborhood for a long time and knew a neighbor. They, they would, if they saw him mowing grass, he'd take a beer over, they'd come over, they'd do a barbecue together, they'd go up to a, you know, a concert together or something because they liked the same kind of music. They did this thing for years. And one day, um, my friend came out and uh, took a beer over to the neighbor. He was working on his car or something. And the neighbor, he said, thanks for the beer, but I got to ask you a question. He said, do you really not like me? And my friend said, what? What? I've, we've known each other forever. We've done all these things together. And he said, yeah, but um, I know that you're a pastor. I know that you're a Christian. And in all these years, you've never once invited me to your church. Do you not like me? And so if we find and we create these spaces where we, we become relational, we have to live as one sent. And part of living as one sent is being obvious that we are one. Now, we don't do. Yeah, we're not going to go, you know, you know, uh, you know we, we all have all had church. You know, we've had different people come to the door and 
want to hand us a, a, a tract and say, hey, do you read this? Or, you know, the, the, you know, the hellfire and brimstone, you know, do you know where you're going to be spending eternity? Are you going to be in the smoking or the non-smoking section? You know, yeah, we, we're not talking about that. But we're talking about just being authentic in who we are in relationship. Otherwise, I, I am so tired of hearing this, and I don't want to ever hear it again. The, they, they, they blame St. Francis of Assisi for saying that we should, we should preach the gospel continuously, if necessary, use words. Well, first of all, if you know anything about the life of St. Francis of Assisi, he never would have said that. But trust me, there will come time when you need to, yes, preach the gospel with your actions, because your actions also preach something different. The line that says that, you know, the fact that, a, you know, um, that a Christian can profess Jesus with his lips but deny him with his actions is the one thing that an unbelieving world simply cannot believe. Well, yeah, our actions are important, but trust me, in that relationship at some point, you're going to need to use words. Yes, absolutely. Amen. Uh, going from missional, which is obviously we're talking about things that you are doing in your everyday life, uh, another, and the Philippine church over here is very good at this, is missionary. Uh, missionary, what do we mean? It's understanding the church is a sent organism, and some in that organism are called to minister to, in drastically different environments. Uh, so it's crossing over to a place, an environment that requires drastic change. Uh, I was talking to, let's see, oh, I can't remember your name, Malou, Malou, and you spent 10 years in Vietnam, is that right? 11, 11 years in Vietnam. That's crossing over to a different environment and culture. Um, I know you have a church, uh, you have a group in China, and you have other groups, and so you guys have done some significant crossing over. I've been to uh, quite a few places and uh, that are not my environment, like such as uh, Nepal and Bangladesh and, and India. And you realize, yeah, there are times, well, it's a drastic environmental change, isn't it? For one thing, it's about 110 degrees hotter <laughs> in some of those areas. <laughs> so missionary is, uh, is, is realizing that uh, sometimes it's, it's a more drastic change. Do we want to, uh, do we want to tap on this now or nah, do it? Okay. Wait till later. When we continue to talk about missionary, the understanding that the church is a sent organism and that some organisms are called to minister in drastically different environments. Okay, we, we understand that. We've talked about that. But a missionary environment is one where there is a great cultural divide, language barriers, um, and drastically different life rhythms. Um, I think you know, Rick and I have had a chance to travel in, in a number of places, and we've, we've experienced this where we've come in and we've realized we don't, we don't understand the culture. We don't understand everything that's going on. We may not understand the language. Um, I spent some time doing missionary work in Central America, and I was invited to speak in a tiny little church up on the, up on the top of a hill um, uh, in a little tiny town called Buenos Aires, which in Spanish means good air, which is kind of funny because it was above a giant factory and it was anything but good air. But we're in this tiny little church that we, we, we had to drive a Jeep up a hill to get to, and they asked me to give a sermon. And there were, oh, there were 200 people there, and it was always oh, exciting. And, and I made a statement during the sermon with a translator. Um, I, I made a statement that, that God does not care what car you drive. And my translator looked at me like I was an idiot, which was an accurate look. And went on for a while and, and then continued on. And, and, and I, okay, I continued and I said, sometimes God just wants to, he wants to bring you out of your comfort zone. Translator is going, ah. Oh. And spends another two minutes explaining to a group of people living in metal corrugated huts for the most part what a comfort zone is because there's no equivalent in their life that he could use as an example. And then told me afterward that of the entire church, not a single one of them owned a car, but the church did have a mule and a cart that they shared. I, because I was coming in with a missionary mindset, but that I was not engaging the cultural divide, the language barriers, and the different life rhythms, I was not living 
in a missional relationship with them, only a missionary. I come, I, I say great words, and, and I leave. Um, and it, it, it was profoundly affected me. And many of the things we did after that, I figured my primary job was to keep the, the village children occupied while other people did real things. Because it, it, I was not doing what I had wanted to do, it was, and that was to be missional, to engage. I was coming in in a missionary mindset. Sometimes we erroneously uh, mix up the two concepts, missional and missionary. Um, and we think that we're called to be missionaries. And missionary is actually a, a special calling. And people who are called to do that know they're called to do that for the most part. And, uh, but most of us are not, and that's okay. Because sometimes we get in, in such a missionary mindset that we ignore the mission field that God has placed us in, which is often right around us. Right, and so what we, you know, a missionary environment is one where there's a. Well, you need to go to the next one if you would, too. I can do. You want that? Thank you. When we when we when we separate the two, we realize that when we're being missional, we are better positioned to reach those that share a common language with us, that share a common culture with us, that share common interests and common life environments. So God has not called all of us to be missionaries, but He has called us to join him in the mission he's doing to be missional. And so that, and that enables us to support missionaries, doesn't it? Because we think that's a great calling that God has given you and we're gonna help you and we praise God for you and we praise God that it's not me, right? I don't wanna go to Vietnam. God has not called me to go to Vietnam and teach for 10 years. I praise God that he had somebody who did. And I've got, I praise God for other, other groups that, that have been called to missionary and which is frankly, Paul was one of them, wasn't he? I mean, look at the areas that Paul went to. He responded to a call. But those he trained in the various churches became missional. And they became missionally minded. And they served the areas where they were, and the church continued to grow where their culture was and their common language. So let's talk a little bit about a missional posture. The idea of proclamation... Our missional posture, because words communicate what we know. Posture represents what we believe and, and feel. You know, we can be all talk, but, but what is our action? And so it, our posture can't be one of proclamation. Um, Jesus made proclamations. He preached sermons on a, on a mount, and, and he, he said great things. But Jesus lived with, walked with, served, shared sat around campfires at night and shared stories, and we don't know all of what he did, but we know that he lived in relationship and, and, and was served people. Um, I, there was a, a major name, and I would, you would recognize it if I told you, evangelist who gave a rally, um, an evangelistic rally in uh, New Delhi a few years ago and was bragging about the fact that they had the largest crowd that, that India had ever seen show up for one of these rallies. And they gave everybody who came forward to receive Jesus in the altar call, they gave them a cross that they had, you know, that they had made. And all these people left rejoicing, carrying a cross. And you, you listen to that and you think, okay, this evangelist got on a airplane, a private jet airplane afterward, and went home. There were no indigenous ministry working with these people, nobody to be there to answer the questions the next day, nobody to sit with them at a meal in a potluck after a gathering, nobody to walk with them on mission to teach them and to disciple them, which means that the vast majority of those people took that cross and went home, and they put it up on the shelf next to the statue of, of Shiva or Kali or you know uh, Vishnu because there was nobody there Nobody had reached down. Nobody had gotten down in the dirt with them. The image that you, you see here, you know, the idea of Jesus coming down to, you know, to the, to the woman, you know, caught in adultery and being there and reaching down. Um, there's a scene in, in one of the Jesus movies with Bruce Marciano where um, he, uh, he's healing a blind man and in the, they're videotaping or sh shooting this in the, for the movie. And, and he's trying to help them up and they, they lose, he loses his balance and they fall over in the street and they're laughing there and, and just kind of slapping each other and getting up. But the camera kept rolling 
And the, um, the director afterwards said, you know what? That's Jesus. Jesus is the one who got down into the dirt and helped the man up. Jesus is, you know, Jesus got dirty. Jesus, yeah, there was not a posture of shouting at. There was a posture of, I am here. The, the humility posture. I'd like you to look at this next point, and I'd like you to think about it. Um, as we go, our missional posture must be an embodiment, embodiment of our message. In other words, we don't want to say one thing and do another. We don't want to say we're inclusive and act exclusive. We don't want to say that we, our posture is humility and then we act elitist. We want our message to be the same. I mean, we want our actions to be the same as our message. And that's what's, that's what's so brilliant about following Jesus the story of Jesus is to see what he did in his life, to see that the, the humble postures that he took as he dealt with his disciples and to see what he did. For example, I, I, this is one of my favorite stories is, is the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus could have easily just uh, grabbed some bread and fish and performed a miracle, but he didn't. He, he got his disciples involved and he said, uh, what do we do? Well, we could go buy some fish, or we could, but you know, we don't have the money. We could do, you know, I don't know. Maybe we just send everybody home. And uh, one disciple says, "Well, there's a little boy here. He's got a couple loaves of bread and a couple fish." And so Jesus, and I, I, the way I kind of see this, I see Jesus is raising this basket up, and he's and, and he's praying, and he breaks it. And as he breaks it, he just keeps giving it to his disciples, and you know, and they're wondering where's all this stuff coming from. And so then he says for them to share it with everybody. And then what does he do at the end? He tells the disciples, what? Go gather it. And how much was left? Twelve baskets. How many disciples? Huh. I think Jesus was saying, I want them to get involved, and I want them to see what I do, and I want them to see that everything that I say and everything that I do is the same thing. That when I say I care for people, I'm going to show them what that means. It's... He could have said, what's the phrase we use? Uh, um, I'll pray for you. All right? It's, it's, a, it's the same thing as, as saying, go, go you and be warmed and filled. You know, the scripture talks about that. If you come to him and, and uh, you ask for something, go you and be warmed and filled. That helps a lot. And what we do as Christians, we, somebody comes up to us with a situation, they say, you know, um, Ada here, she comes up and she says, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a well, let's say she's got a corn on her foot. I'm going to make it simple. And I'll say, that's good, I'll pray for you. But if I don't, I'm not living what I say. And what's the best thing to do? Is say, can I pray for you? Right now? Right here? That is making it a part of our life. Not just saying we care, not just saying you're included, not just saying we believe all people are, are beloved of God, but showing it. And, and especially not excluding people or making them feel excluded. So that's our, that's our missional posture. That's what Jesus did. He continually included people. And even Peter, I used the example earlier, Simon, do you love me? The whole pur purpose there was to bring him back so that he could be a useful servant again. Because this is the guy I said was going to be the rock. I'm going to make sure that he knows this. And we're going to continue this. And he is going to believe that what I say, I mean. And it's not just words. And a lot of Christianity can be just words unless we live it out. And so that missional posture is living it out. Of course, now you make me feel guilty because on more than one occasion, I've seen somebody coming up to me at church and I'm going, oh, that's Bob. I told Bob I was going to pray for him and I forgot to pray for him. Okay, God, whatever it was I was supposed to pray for, please fix. Hi, Bob. How are you? Yeah. It's, it's easy to get caught up in that. Let me ask you a question. What was Jesus accused of by the Pharisees? Well, there were a lot of things, but what, what, was, what was one of the things that they really said, well, this guy can't possibly be a rabbi. He can't be who he, who he says he was. Friend of sinners. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus eats with tax collectors. The woman at the well. Uh, first of all, a, a Samaritan. Second of all, not married, 
living with a with a man, um, you know, he, ah, the woman caught in adultery. I mean, he he goes to a tax collector's house. He says, "Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm eating at your house tonight." Jesus was accused of being a, a drunkard because he went to weddings and celebrated. He was accused of being, uh, you know, um, he was accused of many things. Why? Because he lived the life that he preached. He engaged with the people who needed. The Pharisees weren't all that interested in the message that he had. But if you're the broken woman who is pouring out the last vial of, of fine ointment that probably was an essential part of her job as a prostitute, but she's that broken that she is now weeping and drying Jesus' feet with her hair. Jesus allows that. Jesus reaches down to her. Jesus speaks into her life. Jesus lives out what he preaches. And we're called to do the same thing. We're called to be in relationship with, but to be in a posture where we, we, we're not going to go, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, you, uh, you know, you've had way too many traffic tickets. I can't. Does that apply? Do they give traffic tickets out in the Philippines that way you people drive scares the heck out of me? Um, but, you know, it, we, we judge people based on behavior. We judge people and we, we back away from them. Jesus sees them for who they are. And we're called to do exactly the same thing. All right. Finish this scripture. By this, all men will... Keep saying it. And what scripture is that? John 13, verse 35. All right. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. My favorite scripture lately has been John 13, verse 34. What does that say? Did you already put it up there? Okay. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this is right before he goes to the garden. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, how can that be a new commandment? Hasn't he already had this discussion with somebody that says the two great commandments are to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbors yourself? So how is this new? Right. Because he says, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Now, I want you to think about this. You can love somebody and not be in relationship with them, theoretically. Right? Right? You can say, I love everybody. And we do this. Oh, yeah, I love everybody. I just don't like some people. All right? Or I love them. I just hate their sin. And we go through all these things. But Jesus said, just as I have loved you. Okay, so if this is a new commandment, how did Jesus love us? What are some things he did? Unconditional. Okay, there's, there's a... You can unpack that. How many of you love unconditionally? Well, good. <laughs> You're all wise enough not to raise your hand. That's like asking which child you love best. You know, for me, it's my daughter. She's my favorite child because she gave me grandchildren. The boys are okay with that because they don't want to give me grandchildren yet. <laughs> but they know that she's not my favorite. They all are. But the point is, Jesus says, just as I have loved. So let's talk about that just for a moment. How did Jesus love us? What did he do? Like he died for us. That's huge. What did he do before that? He became like us. Have you ever thought about that? The Son of God became like us? And not, he didn't come as an adult. I mean, he humbled himself in a womb. You talk about lowering yourself to prove your love for people. And then that wasn't enough, was it? We touched on it earlier. He continually loved by serving. How many times did he just feed his disciples? And of course, he washed their feet. In other words, Jesus stepped into our life and walked alongside us. 
He didn't just send us a, a book and said, here's how to live. You know, here's, here's the 10 steps to becoming like me. He entered our world. The whole concept of the missional posture is to enter someone's world with them, walk alongside them, live the life with them, just like, just like the picture shows, getting down on our hands and our knees. That missional posture, if you love, because then it continues, if you have loved one another like I have loved you, this by this all will know you are my disciples. Because your love is not, not, is not just something that you're talking about, it's something that people see. It, they see you sharing life with other people. That's the missional posture. That's what makes good leaders, is to have that missional posture. Good leaders don't just tell, tell, tell somebody, follow me, become like me, I wish you were like me. No, they, they enter the life of those that they're trying to lead. And they make them better leaders by doing so because it's that model, that example, as Jesus loved us. That's the true missional posture. Okay, going back to our key elements, we, we've, uh, we've discussed a couple of those. We've discussed missionally healthy. We've discussed healthy leadership. And now we're going to discuss healthy expressions. What does is, what is a healthy church look like? What, what are you going to see? So let me, before we go to them, let's just ask, healthy expression within your church community, what would you see? Okay, a meal, sharing a meal together. Okay, there, yes. Um, we are a type of people, we love to share meals. We have a lot of meals we share. Okay. What else? Smiles. We are, we are happy people. You come in here and you can see that we're genuinely like to be together. Okay? I had a pastor one time looking out at the congregation, and, and I, I love the line. He asked the question, he said, okay, how many of you have the joy of the Lord in your heart? Everybody, of course, raised their hand, right? And he said, could you have your heart talk to your face? <laughs> that's, that's good. Anyone else? What does what a healthy church look like? Your healthy church community, what does it look like? Ah, praying for one another. Very good. Genuinely praying for one another. Not just taking your, your prayer list home and saying, I'll pray for you. What else? Anything? Okay, so those are good suggestions. Let's, let's show you what uh, people smarter than us came up with. <laughs> Servant service evangelism. Again, the idea of, of coming in and making the proclamation is, is sort of that mindset that the, uh, that the Western church bought into a long time ago. We need to come in and we need to tell y'all that you're sinners, which is really kind of stupid because y'all knew that anyway, right? Um, most of us are not deceived. We know our shortcomings at some level. And then we tell you that your sins are creating this great divide between you and Jesus. And so you need to say the magic prayer that's going to build the, the bridge to cross the great divide. Or they, they write a song about it where it's now the cross to bridge the great divide. And we, we do this proclamation evangelism. Okay, there, you're, you're saved. And we, and we walk away from it. Service, servant evangelism is coming in and doing. It's coming alongside and sharing. It, it can be as simple as, um, you know, as a service project, but not within the community. Um, what kind of an example does it set if, you're, if you have a small group, but they're, they're going over to somebody who has, they have no agenda. They're not doing this because this is a member. They're not doing this because this is somebody that they're, oh, we're, we've we're been working with them and we want to get in. They're doing it because it's somebody who just genuinely needs the help. And they come alongside them and they reach out to them and they make a difference. It can be as simple as that. There are so many avenues where it's a question of evangelizing, but you're evangelizing by living as Jesus and living as one sent rather than just stepping back and saying, you're a sinner. Yeah, like Tim said, it's, it's uh, meeting a need. 
seeing a need as a church and fulfilling that need. But that goes right into uh, some of the comments that we got, the answers we got back, go right into the next one, <coughs> Excuse me, which is inclusive community. You want your church to be known as a safe place. You know, the, uh, the phraseology that I've heard before is it's a hospital for sinners, not a uh, uh, hotel for saints. It's a place where people come and they can be accepted and loved. And, and when I say accepted, we don't want to get into a lot of the... Uh, uh, let me just say this. When I say accepted, no matter what I'm doing in my life, no matter what sins I've got, I can come to the church and I can find help. That's what I mean by accepted. I can come here and I know that I'm, it's a safe place where I can share with somebody, probably not with everybody, but I can share with somebody what I'm going through and I can get help. And it's a safe place where I'm not going to be judged when I'm asking for help. Right? And that's what, that, is, that is so significant in Christianity that I love the fact that Jesus is the judge and he says, I did not come to judge. I, but I've got a lot of people who will do it for me. Right? And that's, it seems like for years that's what we've done. We'll do, it's okay, Lord, we'll take care of the judgment. You just love people, we'll judge them. We're good at that. But it'd be an inclusive community is, is a missional environment, this missional mindset, this missional posture, this designing, deciding what kind of leadership we want to be is having the attitude of an of a inclusive community. And it's evidenced by things like you said, You've got potlucks where people like to hang around. Uh, you've got people who are smiling because they're, they're filled with joy to be there. Uh, you've, got, you've got people who are worshiping with their heart, not just singing a song on, on the, the, because they see the words on the screen. And you've got people who, when they see somebody come in the door, they genuinely desire to go meet them and spend time with them and listen to them. That's an inclusive community. There's an element that um, many churches fall back under, and that's the concept that to belong, you have to first believe. And, and I, grew up, I grew up in a fellowship, as some of you did, where you, you, you wanted to come. We didn't publish the, the address of the local church. We didn't tell people where to come. You had to, you had to go through an interview process. And do, have you read this? And have you understood that? And have you read these? And do you agree with this? Okay, meh, maybe we might let you know where we meet um, but what we really see and we see in the relationship and, and how Jesus works with and who he works with, it really is more of a question of, of belonging and, and then believing. And when we operate under the belong to believe, we can be inclusive. We don't have to have the litmus test. You don't have to know the, the secret handshake. We, we just simply allow people to come through. I have a, I have a young lady in my, my congregation in Eugene who is um, wild hair color that changes weekly um, on the half of her head that has hair. Um, the other half is shaved. And, um, and, and she is a, a, how does she put it? She is a hopeful agnostic. And so I finally asked her one time, I said, Michelle, what's a hopeful agnostic? And she says, well, I don't believe in God, but I hope I'm wrong. So the next logical question for me in that conversation was, and we had a relationship at that point, was, why are you here? Why are you coming here every week? Why? why? You, we preach Jesus Christ in everything we do. You know that whatever the question is, the answer is Jesus. It's just easy. And, and yet you're here every week. And she said, yeah, because I'm accepted and I'm loved. That's what we're talking about. Which leads right into the next one, that a healthy church environment is expressed in relationship building. That when, when, when people come to our congregations, they don't come because they are uh, um, looking for a church where they can just have anonymity. They can just sit there and, and hide. In, our, in GCI, you're going to come in and you're going to build a relationship. That's a healthy church. I, I don't think any of our congregations have people who can come in and not be seen. And uh, this, as a, when I was a pastor, well, I still am a pastor. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was pastoring a congregation that was growing, and uh, somebody said, you know, we keep doing this. We could probably get up to three or 400 people. I said, I don't want to get past 175. 
Because that way, I mean, I have a hard time with names anyway. And if it grows that far, I can't keep up with people. I said, so if we get to that point, we'll plan a new church. Because I want my church to always be a church where people come in and build relationships. I don't want where people can come in and hide. I want people to come in and find people that they love and people who love them. And people who, say, who will take them under their wings until they develop their own uh, level of spiritual maturity and can bring other people in the, under their wings. Because it's a continual process of growth, isn't it? But a healthy church expression uh, is, is a church where relationships are constantly being built. And that means, you know what James says? This is, this is, I think, our biggest weakness is the concept of confessing your sins to one another. That's the result of a healthy church. When you have a healthy church, you trust people. And you do have people you can confess your sins to one another. If you don't have that in your church, maybe it's not as healthy as it needs to be. And maybe it's because we're not focusing on building a relationship. And maybe it's because we're not as, inclu as inclusive as we need to be. And maybe it's because our missional posture is bad. And maybe it's because we don't have a missional attitude. You see how this all relates? So we want to move forward and have our churches be very relationship-oriented. And it starts with whom? It starts with me, doesn't it? I have to care about people to want to build a relationship with them. And so if I don't care about people, then it starts with another missional posture, which is me on my knees saying, Lord, help me to care about people. And sometimes even this, Lord, help me to care about caring about people. Do you hear the difference? It's not just help me care about people, but help me even care about it, about caring. Because I just really don't even care. And we do get in that frame, but we have to, that's when we pray. And we say, Lord, I want to be relational. I want to build relationships with people. Help me to even notice them. <laughs> help me to hear them. Help me to notice their needs. Help me to find a way to reach those needs. And if I can't, help me to find somebody who can. That's relationship building. That's a healthy expression seen in a healthy congregation. Starbucks. I saw you guys have Starbucks here which is good. I can come back. Um, I, Starbucks has made me what I am today, which is kind of nervous and jittery. But um, Starbucks has a principle of um, the owner or the founder of Starbucks has a principle that I, I think is very interesting. He was, he was invited to come to a grand opening of a Starbucks in Kansas City. And, and the line was down the, 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 the block. Everybody was excited, this downtown Starbucks. And the, uh, the manager of it turned to, the, uh, to the, the founder of Starbucks and said, isn't this wonderful? And he said, no, this is terrible. It's very much what Rick was talking about of a church reaching a certain size. He said, I want a place where people can come and they can build relationships, when they can get to know people, when they get to know the barista, when they get to know. And so the, 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 the um, founder of Starbucks said, what's that empty building across the street? And they go, well, it's just an empty building. And he said, lease it and open a Starbucks over there. I was like, wait a minute, opening a Starbucks directly across the street from a Starbucks. And he said, yeah, because then there'll be enough place for people to come and find relationship and they will then develop loyalty to Starbucks. You know, we can do the mega church um, and, you know, and, and get the, you know, we do the big light show and we put the money in and we get, we get a thousand people. Tell me how many people you have a relationship with in a church of a thousand people. And how many of you know the pastor in a church of a thousand people. And how many of you are just slipping in there and slipping out and never once being called into discipleship. These were all things that were within, a, um, within the greater church community. Um, we want to get into the existing body. We're going to go into where we're talking about healthy expressions now. And we're going to get specific. We're going to start meddling. Because we're going to be talking about within our particular fellowship. Uh, within our, our churches now. This is ghetto talk, but this is good ghetto talk. Um, we're going to be talking about our corporate worship. Corporate worship. Um, where are the gentlemen from Mindanao? Where they, where they, where they, where they sneak? Well, there's somebody from Mindanao. I was talking to three young gentlemen from Mindanao. Did they slip out of here? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, we, were, we were chatting with, um, with, with a little earlier about worship and some of the kind of, they're doing some cool cutting edge. And they, I was talking to one of their bass players. I'm a musician, so anytime I, I get a chance to talk to musicians, especially young musicians, I will. 
but you know, the, some of the struggles and you know, doing some cutting edge, and we were talking about finding that environment that's inclusive in worship. Um, I cut my teeth on rock and roll. Um, you know, when, when Kiss came to the forum uh, many years ago, some of our young people have no idea who Kiss is. Um, it was a wild out there group, you know, they spit blood and flames and all the cool stuff. I have a t-shirt somewhere where Gene Simmons spit fake blood on it because I was in the fifth row. Um, I cut my teeth on rock and roll. I like that. I like, I like the high intensity driving, whatever. But on the other hand, I recognize that within the corporate body, there are going to be people that very much want the, want the lower, the simplistic. And it's not just an age thing. What I'm finding now is that millennials more and more are shifting from the high intensity worship and going back to more of the introspective, the, the, the more um, melodic worship styles and, and away from the repetitive choruses. So worship is going to be a dynamic that's going to change, but finding that inclusive area where you can bring people in and where they feel that the worship is authentic. See, it's not about whether the worship has a screaming lead guitar line or whether the worship is done entirely on a piano, or whether the worship is done a cappella, and there's no instruments at all. It's about whether the worship, the corporate worship, is authentic and inclusive. And so finding, so um, uh, forgive me any of our leadership in Mindanao, but the advice I gave the young folk from there was, you know, if you can find something in every worship set that irritates everybody, um, you have succeeded because you've also found things that have touched and reached everybody, to find that corporate unity in worship is so significant because when that person comes in and knows that they're involved, knows that they're included, that this is quality, that you're serious about it. As Rick said, it's not just singing it because there's words up there, but actually read those words and, and allow them to speak to your heart because when people come in and they see that, they are going to be drawn into the corporate worship as well. That's part of, of that, of creating that environment. This may surprise you, but I grew up in a church that I thought I was the one true church. Um, <laughs> and uh, so therefore, whenever I went to a conference, I knew I was the one true Christian at this conference of, you know, Catholics and Protestants and whoever else. And so, uh, and, I, and I had that mentality for a few years that may surprise some of you. Um, so I went to a, uh, I was invited to a, uh, a uh, Catholic youth conference, and uh, I was the editor of the youth magazine for, G for World Wide Church Scout at the time, now GCI. And uh, so um, I was invited to, to go there and to share our magazine, to talk to people about uh, youth-related issues. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it's a Catholic organization, I'm going to be the only Christian there. So I prayed and asked God to, you know, help me be a good light and so on and so forth. Anyway, so I get there, and uh, I set up my booth with the youth magazine, got my big sign up there and everything, and I hear worship music started. And uh, so after a while, I thought, well, I'll just go over and see with these non-Christians how they worship. And I walked in this room of about 2,000 teenagers, and I, and I looked for about two seconds, and I said, Lord, do I even know what worship is? Because they were worshiping. And by the end of the week, and I asked God, Am I a Christian? Because they were, they were worshiping the one who was worthy of worship. And I had spent all of my life singing songs. And it made me realize that I wanted to be a part of that environment of worship. And I think that the, the whole concept of a healthy church is when you see people, like Tim said, not just singing words, but are singing to the one who is worthy of all the worship. It's a heart issue, isn't it? And so it doesn't matter if it's rock and roll with Tim or my wife likes country and other people like different things and, and there's beautiful hymns and there's beautiful ballads and there's beautiful rock music. And I interviewed a guy, he was a, he was a, a lead singer for a group called White Heart, which was heavy metal. I don't like heavy metal. And I asked him, how do you justify doing heavy metal music in Christianity? And he said, who's going to preach to those who like heavy metal music? Wow. That was humbling. Again, God likes to you know, wake me up with those little silly questions I ask. 
It doesn't matter the style of music. What matters is that you provide an opportunity for worship in your congregation and that visitors come in and they are able to worship. And worship is not just music. It's a whole environment, isn't it? It's, 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 the, it's the singing. It's the offertory. It's the, uh, the drama or the kids' activities. That it's all pointing to the one who's worthy of worship. And so corporate worship is when people come into your congregation, they see the one you're worshiping. Which, frankly, takes the attention off of us who are not doing so well on the worship team. Right? That's what we're, that's what we're talking about, that cor corporate worship. This is a tricky one. You want to you run with this one? Sure. Yeah, have it. Every, the, the other thing that that you will see in a healthy church is, is spiritual disciplines taking place. What are some of those spiritual disciplines? I think somebody talked, mentioned it earlier. They talk about if when you're in church and you see people praying, that's a spiritual discipline, isn't it? And that shows a sign of a healthy church. So I love it when I come into church and I see a, a, two or three people over there and all of a sudden they break into prayer. I release somebody just shared something and somebody else didn't say, well, I'll pray for you. They said, may I pray for you? And it's taking place right there. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. There's all spiritual disciplines. Are, there's a whole gamut of them. Worship is one of them. Um, but but when you have a healthy church, you're, you, people are going to say, you know, I was uh, I was fasting last week, and a new person says, well, what does that mean? Well, I I, uh, I decided not to have supper, and uh, in fact, I didn't have supper or lunch, and I spent those two times praying to God. Well, why would you do that? Well, it's called fasting. I gave up something so I can spend time with God. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, do I, have to, do I have to give up two meals? No, you can give up one meal. Or you can just give up one thing. The concept is, is, you know, give up something and spend that time with God. That's a spiritual discipline. Another spiritual discipline is meditation. You know, where you, where you, where you can sit there and, and, and you're, you're talking to somebody and, and they'll say, they'll be talking to you and say, well, how'd you go with that idea? Well, I spent some time with God and I just listened. What? God speaks to you? That... Well, not really. He doesn't, no, I didn't hear his voice. But as I sat there, scriptures popped into my head or thoughts popped into my head. In other words, what I gave myself was time to listen to God. And I was just outside looking at a bush and this thought came to me. And, and, said, and they, they, they realized that's a spiritual discipline. They, they start to think, well, wow, this thing about being in relationship with God is real to you, isn't it? Yeah. And so you can go through all the spiritual dis disciplines. The, the, the point of this healthy expressions in a church is that it's part of your conversations with people. As they realize that, that singing is more than just singing to you. They realize that offerings is more than just giving to you. They realize that everything that you do, you do for the one who's worthy of all worship. The tricky part of it is, is it, it is a slippery slope towards a judgmental legalistic structure within the church that becomes unhealthy. I fast more than you, well, I'm going to say this and it's an absolute lie because people say fasting draws you closer to God. Fasting draws me closer to my refrigerator. But, you know, <laughs> but you can have people go, oh, I fast more than you do. I mean, don't we have a biblical, well, I fast three times a week, um, you know, it's, I, I fast every night from the time I go to sleep until I wake up. But, um, but we, we start to get into this where it becomes something that we use as a judgmental, it's something that we use as a wedge, something that we use, I pray more than you do, and I, I pray for an hour every morning, or I pray for... And, and so it's an area where we have to be careful. So the word, the operative word here is healthy. You know, this has to be in its perspective, its overall perspective. One more point on this, and then we need to break. I am skinning that, that thing. And so we're just going to simply touch on this one, and that's healthy community. Um, and, and I think this is an absolutely perfect one to, to end this on because you all are about to go and become a healthy community. Healthy community is what we do outside of th this, outside of I, um, I did this once to my congregation and irritated them to no end. I asked them, show of hands, I said, how many of you have had somebody into your house to watch TV, watch a sporting, a sporting event, to hang out, to play cards, to do something that didn't involve a meeting, it didn't involve a Bible study, it didn't involve talk, sitting, getting together to, to say bad things about the pastor? Um, <laughs> 
that it involved just being part of community. And then how often are you doing that outside of the immediate? But, but what's important is, is that we're talking about, you know, kind of within the structure itself. We, I, I've told every, every pastoral resident and intern that I've worked with, I said, we, we, we make the statement that you have to love everyone, but you don't have to like them. I disagree with that. I believe that we really are called to love each other and like each other. Now, do I understand that like each other is the hard part of that equation? Okay, I got that. But it's coming together in community that allows us to demonstrate because we saw the scripture. How are they going to know that we are disciples and followers of Jesus? Because we love one another. Well, the one another seems to imply, because Paul, look up Google one another sometime or look it up in your Bible reference. Paul uses it over and over. We're to love one another, spur one another on to good works, um, you know, pray for one another. Well, guess what? If you don't have community, if there is not an established community, you don't have a one another. And it just doesn't work that way. So I think we're going to break now and we're going to do some one another stuff. And, um, and that's good. That's good. So